We're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. This is Alex, and I'm out here in California, and we've got our whole crew here. Uh, uh, well, we don't have our whole crew here. Molly is with her family camping up in Washington, I think, someplace up in up near Canada. But uh, otherwise, we've got Tolga here, and we've got Terry. He's from all the way down in um, in um, Australia. Um, in Australia. And Eric's from Illinois. And of course, we've got our presenters, Rachel Freed and Ryan and Carla. So they're all here today. And Tolga wanted to make it a point for you to see them all. So hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to start presenting my screen. And uh, I want to tell you about something we got going here. We just kind of came up with this idea. Um, if you go over to the Astro, if you go over to the Astro Imaging Channel, uh, you'll see this thing called contact. Now, I don't know about you, but everybody else I know in the Astro Imaging world has been taking pictures of this comet thing. Okay, Neo Wise is up in the northwest skies, and it's been pretty cool. And we, you know, there's no way that we can get you to easily present your your comet pics here, but we thought it might be nice if we just put them all together at one time. So if we could, uh, if you guys would come over to the astroimagingchannel.org and you've seen the website before, go to the contact button and go ahead and um, uh, send us um, um, a, you know, submit something um, and, and uh, We'll send you. We'll send your response as to how you can send us our com your comet pictures, and we'll try to put them together somehow. We haven't worked out the details of all this, but we just figure we'll make a little PowerPoint of all the, the comet pictures. Uh, this is also, incidentally, the place where you can send us stuff about um, uh, if you want to present something, if you've got something that you have been working on that you would like to share with the astroimaging world. Well, this is the place where you would put your name in to do that. Uh, I always take a, a moment or two here to tell us about uh, what's coming up. Obviously, today we've got Rachel and Carla and Ryan, uh, Akala and Ryan, and they're going to be telling us about the AIC library. Remember, AIC really stands for the Advanced Imaging Conference. TAIC came along later, and they are not AIC. It's a different operation. All right, uh, but they've opened up their video library of all the presentations through the years, and Rachel's going to tell us about that. And then Calla and Ryan are going to get together and tell us about some projects that they've got going in astroimaging. Uh, my kid's going to be here to tell us about building a remote operating um, shed observatory. Graham Hay's going to be doing transient objects a week after that, and Alex Cherney's going to come along and tell us about nightscape photography and time-lapse animations. And we're pretty much well scheduled for a while here. We've got some opens and to be announced coming up in September. We would like you to help fill them if you can do something to um, spread your astroimaging knowledge. It would be of great value to us. OK, with all that in mind, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, get back to you. Uh, Rachel is here. Uh, Rachel comes to us from, oh, she's the newly uh, elected um, uh, member of the Board of Trustees of the Advanced Imaging Conference, and she stepped in at the last minute. You probably heard me say last last week that our presenter, scheduled presenter for this week, couldn't be here, but Rachel stepped in, volunteered, and brought along a couple of people that have been working on some projects. So I'm going to let you take it, Rachel, if you can take it from here. Uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to be here again. I was here in September. Um, and let me share my screen. Um, so we're going to be talking to you about a couple different things today. So we're going to be talking about um, the AIC library, and I'm very excited to be on the board of the Advanced Imaging Conference. And then we're going to talk to you about projects um, that Ryan and Kel are working on. So, and I want to just put a little this in a little bit of context. So about me, I work with students around the country and educators, college instructors, high school teachers to help students and teachers get involved in astronomy research. And there's, of course, a lot of tie over between research and imaging. There are people who start out in imaging and go into research. There are people who go in to start out in research, and go into imaging, astro imaging. And, um, so these are 
of course, very related. And a lot of the work I do is um, bringing together these different communities, the US research and education community with uh, imagers, um, so that we can all just do more cooler things together. So um, I'm going to talk about the AIC library, and then they're going to talk. They're going to take over. But I just want to mention uh, I'm the president of the Institute for Student Astronomical Research. Um, uh, there's a picture up here showing me at Mount Wilson that ties into the research program or the research that Cal and Ryan have been doing. I'll get into that later. And of course, I had to put up my comet picture. It's not the greatest, but it's what I can do with what I have. So. Um, one of the things that I always keep in mind in everything I do is how to make education meaningful and relevant, relevant to students, meaningful, interesting. Um, and, and actually, I work with not just students, not just teachers, but people, anyone that's interested in using telescopes for research or imaging. Um, so always in the back of my mind. And so I want to have that be sort of the lens with, with which we think about all this today. How do we make education meaningful and relevant? Um, and so I co-founded and I'm the president of the Institute for Student Astronomical Research. And under that umbrella, I teach a lot of astronomy research seminars. And I just uh, we've been using Zoom. I know it's really fashionable now, even though I guess we're on Google Meet, but we've been using Zoom for years for our program. But over the past 10 years, we've had over 200 published research papers with 500 co-authors of you know students ranging from eighth grade up through graduate students. Um, and that's that's sort of my my focus in life. <laughs> um, we publish a lot of our work in the Journal of Double Star Observations. And as of this year, 50% of the articles that are now published in the Journal of Double Star Observations come from students doing astronomical research within the sort of structure of the astronomy research seminars that I run. So that's really exciting. So we're up to halfway through the year, um, you know, more than 15 published papers. And I think we're on track to at least have 35 this year. So that's exciting. And I have students, I try to provide opportunities for students to present at all the conferences I go to. Just occurred to me, I made this an opportunity for students to present research. That's exciting. <laughs> um, so we, ha we had students that presented at NEAC last year. We would have done it this year, but well, pandemic. Um, and we have students that take it further. They do research and then they say, you know what? We need a better online browser-based tool to, to search for double stars to research. And they build it. Um, and you're going to see what Kala and Ryan have sort of taken on in this starting out with research and then just doing more and more. And it's really amazing. Um, and our programs are all over the country. And that's really exciting. And actually, I'd say this map is now six months old and there should be lots more dots on it. I'll have to update that map. But um, it's really exciting work. And we are one of the, the global sky partners with the Las Cumbres Observatory Telescope Network. So we actually get to use telescopes around the world northern and southern hemisphere and that's really exciting and um yeah the imaging opportunities are pretty amazing um and there's an example that's one of the one meter telescopes that we occasionally get to use normally we're we're limited to the 0.4 meter telescopes but um it's fun stuff so what i want to talk to you about right now is the advanced imaging conference and if you have not been to the advanced imaging conference i I'm going to encourage you to come out. It's it's we have over a year from now, so hopefully by then we can all get together in person and things will be safe and open again. But October eighth through tenth, twenty twenty one, at the San Jose Convention Center in California. Um, so here, the Advanced Imaging Conference really started out as a group of people that were interested in imaging and wanted to get together and share their knowledge with each other. And it's grown over the years, over fifteen plus years. Um, and there are talks, there are workshops where you can get into great detail um, about how to use Pix Insight and all the other things. And I'm going to show you some of the past workshops that have um, taken place. But what I really want to mention is they decided to make their library of recorded past workshops and talks freely accessible to the public. That's all of us. Um, you do need to become a member, but membership is free. You just go on their website and click the login button to make yourself a member for zero dollars that's a great price to have access to all this stuff um, and once you are logged in you can you'll see the enter the aic digital library okay this is where it gets exciting you guys okay so he they have their all their recorded presentations from 2019 and the conference now happens every two years um, so 2017 2015 etc so let's take a look at what are some of the things that people talked about that you can go and watch their videos? 
So um, bringing out faint structures in deep sky imagery, so cool. In fact, they, they often have um, award, they have actually every year award ceremonies at the conference and they bring in people that have done amazing things. And I, I got to see in a, a talk uh, two years ago, I think, that was just incredible about finding these um, star streams in galaxies from doing super deep imaging. And it was really phenomenal. Um, but uh, telescope collimation, there's a lot about PIX insight. So I know I'm speaking to a bunch of astrophotographers and if you're really interested in getting a little more information here, um, you know, digging deeper with Sequence Generator Pro or um, there's a lot of PIX insight here or guiding with PhD2 or Photoshop. So these, it tells you how long the videos are. What's also great is if you click, you can learn about who all of these, if you don't already know who the speakers are for each of these, you can just click on their, uh, uh, their names and see what, what they're about. For example, Carrie Ann, um, she was one of the speakers the last few years. And on the website, they, not only do they have the, in this case, an hour and 43 minute long uh, workshop that Carrie Ann gave, but they also have for you to download her slides in a PDF format. So it tells about the speaker. It has their whole workshop right there for you to freely learn from, and you can download the contents. They don't have that for all of them, the, the, the contents to download, but um, a lot of them they do. So that's really cool. Um, so I wanna go back to just look at a couple more of the topics. Um, running your rig with new tech. Richard Wright, probably everyone knows who Richard Wright is. Um, the path from CCD to CMOS, that's actually an interesting one that's applicable to what you'll hear Ryan and Akala talking about tonight. Um, and let's see, so Carrie Ann, she's, she was there. The, the conference before that, of course, picks insight, um, imaging under seeing limited conditions, that might be a big issue for many of us. Um, Ooh, secrets of deep sky imaging with the DSLR. Anyway, so you can see that there's quite a range of topics here and it's all freely accessible to you. And I would encourage you to go join the site, um, explore the library, learn more, and come and meet us all in person at the conference next year in October. And um, with that, so that's the Advanced Imaging Conference Digital Library. Please, you know, join that group and um, join us. It's a lot of fun. and um, there's so much to learn from each other. I love being part of this community. Okay, so um, with that, I wanna just briefly mention um, how, what Ryan and Cal are gonna be talking to you about, how that sort of came about, I think. Um, so they're gonna be talking about speckle interferometry and a student robotic telescope network. So two sort of related things that they're working on together. And um, we, the Institute for Student Astronomical Research, we usually hold, we've started holding seminars for students up at Mount Wilson. But this year, and we get to use the 100 inch or the 60 inch telescope, but this year, of course, with the pandemic, we had to change things up and we did it online. So we had these big Zoom meetings where we invited students and teachers um, and some of us, the engineering team, some of us went up and we're at Mount Wilson and socially distanced and wear, wore masks and put the equipment on. We put a, um, a camera onto, let's see, do I have a picture? I don't think I have a picture, no, of that. Um, put a little camera, a ZWO camera onto the big 60 inch telescope um, and collected speckle data live over Zoom so we could bring people into Mount Wilson even though we couldn't actually bring them into Mount Wilson. Um, and so students got to, and we collected speckle interferometry data which they're gonna talk to you about. Um, and they've now done a lot more speckle interferometry. This was just in May and now they're, they'll tell you about the papers they're writing where they've studied, I don't know, more than 30 double stars. But what's so cool about speckle interferometry, and you'll hear from them, um, the picture on the right shows a double star. And the reason we do double stars for research for students is because it's, a, it's sort of the simplest entry point into research, into astronomy. It's a, something that's manageable in the small time frame that we have. And um, this picture is from one of the Las Cumbres Observatory 0.4 meter telescopes showing about as close a pair of double stars as we can actually resolve. Those stars are about point, uh, 5.7 arc seconds apart from each other. And that about to down, uh, down to five arc seconds is the limit that we can sort of resolve with the 0.4 meter telescopes and the equipment from the Las Cumbres Observatory telescopes that our students have free access to, which is a whole other amazing program. Um, but what Ryan and Kala are working on can get 
10 times closer stars and it's awesome. So um, I think I'm gonna have Ryan and Kala take it away. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let you guys take over. So Ryan, you can both turn on your mics and there you go. Get it going. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, we are doing double star, and I I first got into it a while ago because of Rachel, and well, specifically because of my astronomy teacher, Kalei Talk. And man, it's pretty addictive. <laughs> and the 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 whole process. And I met Kala last year, and and she's been. I, I kind of mentored her project, and she's really been the, the she was the shining student of Calais class last year, and so we're doing more over the summer. But the I guess the theme as each project goes along, I've done a few now is is I always want to do more. I can't just settle for doing the same thing over and over again. So I think like the first project I did, I measured like one double star, and I was like, oh yeah, I've measured one, guys. And then the next. Uh, project I did like something around 12 and 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 then I did um, faint and high delta magnitude did it with Kala and now we're doing measurements below the seeing limit and the way we can push past the seeing limit this five arc second limit um, is by doing speckle interferometry and it reaches the diffraction limit of the telescope and the way it works is you take really short exposures of the target uh, less than 40 milliseconds and what this does is it freezes the scene. And the specific, I wouldn't say aberrations, but I guess distortions might be a better word. The specific distortions that the atmosphere causes is it breaks the image up into a pattern of speckles. And these speckles, the key to these speckles is that they're diffraction limited. They're technically diffraction limited images. Because if the scene were to destroy the image, we could never recover that information because we can't recover information that's lost. The information's technically still there. So in this image on the right, you see a bunch of dots. This is of two stars. The information of those two stars is still contained within that frame. It's just scrambled up. And the specific way it's scrambled is these speckles, these diffraction limited speckles are superimposed on top of each other. And there's like, a lot of speckles. I'm not sure how many, but this was taken with the Mount Wilson telescope, the 60 inch. So, I mean, you can visually see perhaps nine or 10 or so, but there's probably 50 or a hundred speckles in there, all superimposed, all mashed together. And each one of those is diffraction limited. And if we can somehow get that information out, then we can reach the diffraction limit. And so this is distinct from lucky imaging. It's a different way to, to reach the diffraction limit. And it's a bit more suited for uh, double stars. And then as a side note, we also take short exposures of a reference star, which is any star that's a single star and not a double. And that allows us to clean up some of the aberrations, like for example, if the collimation's off um, or just in general, it, it improves the visibility um, somewhat. And so every double star uh, image has many speckles with both the primary and the secondary. And you can see in the uh, figure on the left, there are um, the brightness of the primaries are the red numbers, and then the brightness of the secondaries are up to and two to the left from their corresponding primaries, and those are the numbers in green. And this, of course, is a simplified picture of what a double star image looks like. A real double star image has a grid that's much bigger than 10 by 10. There's a lot more than five speckles, and the brightness of a star takes up more than one pixel. But this grid is a good representation um, to show what autocorrelation does. And in autocorrelation, a copy of this grid is made and it's moved in every direction on top of the original. And for each direction that the copy is moved, the brightnesses of the pixels are uh, multiplied together and then all of these products are added together. And depending on which direction the copy is shifted, the sum of the brightness products will vary in value. And so if the copy isn't shifted at all, the brightness of all the pixels will be multiplied by themselves. And this will produce a large sum. And that is like the 755 in the figure on the right. And uh, other large sums will be when the copy is shifted up to and to the left, because that's when the primary 
brightness is multiplied by the secondary's brightness, and also when the copy is shifted two to the right and two down, um, and that produces the same number. And this figure on the right is not an image, but it's a power spectrum density, and it represents the brightnesses of the stars, but you can't actually do photometry on this. And it being a power spectrum density is also shown by the two sidebands, which are the 374 values. Only one of those is the secondary, but because of the symmetry in shifting up into the left versus down to the right, um, there's a mirror image. And so autocorrelation only works if you have a ballpark idea of where the secondary should be so that you can pick between the two sidebands. And it doesn't work if you are discovering the double star. Um, there needs to be previous measurements. But if you do have that previous measurement, you can pick the correct sideband and measure the position angle and separation. Okay, so this is the telescope that was used for this study. And this is my telescope in the aptly named Purple Sky Observatory. It, I named it that because of the beautiful purple skies that sometimes are in the morning. And I have the Guangxian Optical 6-inch Classical Cassegrain. This operates at F12, and that's native. There's no focal reducers or extenders. And the Ioptron Iop CEM60, this mount is a wonderful mount. I get amazing tracking with it. And perhaps most importantly is the camera, for speckle at least. And that, that this is the ZWO ASI 1600. That camera, <laughs> I'm sure as many of you know, is the workhorse of um, amateur astrophotography. But in addition to astrophotography, it's an amazing camera for speckle. There's a pretty big debate between whether CMOS or CCD chips are better. But for speckle, CMOS chips are vastly superior, and that's because they have low read noise. The exposure times in speckle are no greater than 40 milliseconds. So we're automatically using just the very bottom of the full well of these pixels. And that means that we need that bottom of the full well to be as, have as little noise as possible. And that means we need to have the read noise to be as low as possible. So we need a camera that can operate in a very high gain, low read noise um, operation. And the CMOS chips are very well suited for this task. In addition, CCD chips take on the order of about a second to read out, whereas CMOS chips are faster, a lot faster, perhaps, you know, five, 10 milliseconds to read out. It, Cal and I usually take around 4,000 pictures per double star, somewhere around there, because you have to take pictures for the target star as well as the reference star. So I wouldn't really want to sit there for over an hour waiting for images to download. That would have a very low duty cycle. And so the CMOS chips are pretty much only suitable or speckle interferometry can only be done on CMOS chips. Doing it on, on CCD is very difficult. And I also have the ASI 290 for guiding, although you don't need to guide with speckle interferometry because since you're taking short exposures, the tracking doesn't really matter. However, or actually this is really good because um, it's like planetary imaging where the only thing that matters is the telescope. And as long as your mount can point somewhere and not move off, not have random arc minute size jumps, then you're able to take science data. And so it really kind of opens the door to a lot of people. And so I don't have a telescope and yet I was able to use Ryan's telescope to uh, do this speckle interferometry. But Ryan lives about a thousand miles away from me. So I had to use his telescope remotely. So we, I use AnyDesk to log into Ryan's desktop. So on my screen, I see Ryan's screen. And when I move my mouse, it moves the mouse on his computer. So I can use the software he has to control the telescope and take images. And we also had two other students joining us. We had Jed in Hawaii who was there for the beginning part and Caroline in New York. And she woke up really early to catch us at the end. And Ryan and I observed the whole night. Ryan was there to make sure that we didn't uh, break his telescope by slewing it into a wall or that the, make sure the cables don't get tangled. And I was there because it was my first time ever controlling a telescope and it was really fun. Um, but the idea with remote observation is that because students from different time zones can all participate and work with one telescope, you don't need to stay up all night to get a full night of observing. And so we used, uh, for this observation, we used AnyDesk 
to um, remotely log into Ryan's desktop. We use Curse to Seal as mount control and to slew to our targets. And we use Nina for plate solving and SharpCap to like, center the images and to change exposure time and to uh, take the captures. And we chose these programs because they're free, but also because they're pretty user friendly, especially for someone like myself who has no prior knowledge uh, about telescopes. Uh, the first night we did it, um, a lot of time was spent getting to know the programs and um, triple checking before every button was clicked. And we got 10 stars that night. But by the second night, um, I had my bearings a lot better with the programs. And we got 31 double stars. So that's a steep learning curve, I guess. <laughs> and I want to say that Kala was, you know, chilling in her in her house, nice and warm, while I was outside sweating in the Texas heat, covering <laughs> bugs <laughs> for seven hours straight. So um, a bit difference in, in what we were actually doing. Uh, this is SharpCap in action. And you can see, uh, I guess, the most prominent thing is a double star in the middle. And this was actually taken with uh, Russ Janay. He has an observatory. And I'll talk about that later, but it, his observatory is doing speckle. And Cala took this picture of any desk, which is screen sharing Russ's observatory computer. So this is on Russ's computer, but Cala took the screenshot. So that's, I think that's pretty cool. And this double star is somewhere around three arc seconds. I'm not sure which one. There's a lot. <laughs> they get jumbled around. Um, but if, if this were doing, if we were doing a traditional CCD imaging technique, this star, like I would look at this picture and be like, mm, that's not going to work because you can see it's smeared. There's not a clear separation. There's no, they're not round. Um, however, for speckle, this is actually a wide pair because speckle can reach the diffraction limit, regardless of the scene, relatively regardless of the scene. I may, maybe if you have like 10 arc second full half maximum, you might want to close up for the night, but in average scene conditions, it can reach the diffraction limit. And Russ has an 11 inch telescope. So three arc seconds is nothing for that. And we, Kala and I have image targets where we look at it and it's, it's a star. It's like, that is a single star. There's no way <laughs> there's a double star in there. And then we'll do the reduction and out pops two stars, just like magic. So this is a, believe it or not, a wide pair for speckle. The things to look at is the region of interest up on the right. That is really important because the 1600 produces, it's 32 megabytes per frame. And if you're doing 20 frames per second, that's a lot of data per second that you're gonna be um, collecting and you don't need that. And so the region of interest is, is very important. And, and for planetary astrophotography, it's essentially the same region of interest. And then the exposure time and gain, usually exposure is at 40 milliseconds because not every star is sixth magnitude. There's more <laughs> seventh magnitude than six and more eighth than seventh. So um, most targets are gonna be fainter. And so 40 milliseconds gets as much light as possible. And the gain is always over 200 because a low gain has higher read noise. And even though a high gain looks like the image is more noisy, it's just because it's doing, well, it's doing two things. It's, it's doing a stretch of the image in the camera, at least. And then it's also changing the read characteristics. And it actually lowers or it increases the signal to noise, even though it appears to make the image more noisy. And the point at which you really need it to hit is a gain of 200, at least for the 1600 chip. Anything over 200 and you are pretty much at about as low of read noise as you're going to get in Europe and really good territory for that. And so um, this is what a speckle capture looks like. These are 40 millisecond um, exposures of a 1.89 arc second um, separation double. And we were really excited to get this star because we thought that um, two arc seconds of separation was going to be the limit for Ryan's telescope. So getting under two and under 1.9 was very exciting. And we actually had to image the star twice because I was impatient and I wanted to image it before it was high enough in the sky and then the images were bad. But you can see that in that video, the stars were jumping around a lot and the noise from the atmosphere uh, varied from frame to frame. So when you process the image using um, autocorrelation, a lot of this noise goes away. 
And in that video, you can also see that the stars, you can see that there's two stars there. And that's because the seeing happened to be very good that night. And like Ryan was saying in the past slide, most of the time stars look like a single blob and you have to process them in order to see that there's two stars there. And one thing you might be wondering is why can't we just do a short exposure like this and then measure just a, like a traditional CCD technique where we go to some program and just set an aperture size and then just measure across and there we go. Because you can see two peaks there and, and they do look relatively well resolved. However, if you look at the frames and, and some frames are worse than others, the stars are oftentimes not round. And that's because the, um, it's not the mount tracking, it's just the atmosphere might um, blow one way, blow another way, and that makes the stars asymmetric. And so it's essentially the same rule in traditional CCD imaging. If you star, or I guess in any astrophotography or astro imaging, if your stars are, aren't round, you're doing something wrong. And in the case of speckle, we can't get round stars because the atmosphere is constantly moving. And at the pixel scales that we're operating at, you're never going to have round stars unless you're in space, which we're not. So speckle works well for even these stars that are partially resolved like this one. And another thing to note is this was with the six inch telescope and the, the Guangxian optical telescope. And it is 1.89 arc seconds, which is closer than we expected to be the limit. I mentioned earlier that we could reach the diffraction limit, which for six inch should be about one arc second because I was in um, V band. Well, that assumes that the pixel scale is up to the task of, of, of that. Um, I'm operating at F12, which might be slow <laughs> for some, but for speckle, it's actually very fast. It's actually too fast. It's undersampled. It's optimal to have about seven to eight pixels across the airy disk. So seven to eight pixels across one arc second. So about 0.2 arc seconds per pixel. I have five pixels across the airy disk, 0.43 arc seconds per pixel, which is not enough pixels to reach the C or the um, diffraction limit because there's simply not enough. Like if there were two stars separated by an arc second, there's just not enough pixels between those centroids or between the peaks to actually measure anything with confidence. About five pixels is the limit to what you can measure, regardless of the telescope aperture which is what we found here. We think this is about 4.6 pixel separation. And this isn't totally bad though, because operating in F12, which is fast, <laughs> is, is a benefit because it is faster than something like F15 or F20. And it allows a little bit fainter stars to be measured because we, you just packing more light into each pixel. And we found experimentally that 10.3 was getting pretty faint. Like you could barely see a 10.3 star with the 40 millisecond exposure. So we suspect that somewhere between 10.5 and 11 is the faintest we could go, um, which is pretty good considering a six inch aperture and 40 millisecond exposures. And the actual software that does the speckle reduction is Speckle Toolbox. And it's written by Dave Rowe of Plane Wave Instruments. Um, many of you probably know his name. He is an amazing astronomer um, that has done so much for the amateur and professional astronomy community. And one of those things is writing this amazing software that I don't know is if it's replicated. This is the only software I know that does speckle, although I might be wrong. The first step is to make fits cubes. This turns the giant image pile, the 500 frames or so of your target into one file. So it just puts them in a stack. It doesn't stack them like astrophotography stacking. It just puts them in a pile. So when you move the one file, it contains all the 500. So you don't have to deal with a giant folder of files, which is nice. And then we do speckle process fits cubes, which performs a Fourier transform to generate the power spectrum density. This does the technique that Calla was describing earlier with the autocorrelation where it looks at the speckles and it tries to match the primary speckle with the secondary speckle. And figure out which speckle goes with which other speckle. And then the speckle reduction simply displays the PSD. And then from that calculates the PA and SEP. And it doesn't first calculate PA and SEP, it calculates the separation in pixels and then the orientation relative to the plate. So like relative to a straight on the, on the, on the image. 
the you have to supply it with the camera orientation and the pixel scale, which you can get one of two ways. In the program, you can get it using a drift calibration, which is a bit more complicated. You take a you point towards a star, a single star, and then you turn off the tracking and take a sequence of images as the star drifts through the frame. And you can put that into the program and it will automatically use the time codes that are in the image headers um, to find the rate at which it's moving to calculate pixel scale. And then it can find the angle at which it's moving to find the camera angle. This is really useful because it replaces the option of a plate solve. Um, we are able to do plate solves because I can just turn off the region of interest, get the entire image chip. And for me, the field of view is like 23 by 30 arc minutes, somewhere around there. And that's that's more than enough for plate solving. And we can get the camera angle and pixel scale from there. But some telescopes, like I know an astronomer, Rick Wasson, who does speckle, he uses a 22 inch telescope, I believe F16, with the ASI 290, which is a super small chip. And it has something like a two arc minute field of view. And I don't think you're going to be plate solving a two arc minute field of view unless you have some really special software. So the drift calibration works if you can see a star. It only takes a single star to work. And if you can't do a drift calibration, it means you can't see any stars. And then why are you doing speckle? You can't see stars. So a drift calibration is an amazing tool that always works. And this is what a speckle reduction looks like. You have a place to put the PSC of your target and the PSC of your reference, which lowers the noise in the image because it compares the atmosphere. And then removing the photon, the photon bias further uh, lessens the noise. And then changing the Gaussian filters will sharpen the image. And then once that's done, what's produced is the uh, image on the right, where you can see a bright primary and then two sidebands, one of which is a secondary. And this is a pretty good image here. It's um, actually of the same 1.89 arc second star from the video. And you can see that this is a lot clearer, a lot less noise, and it's ready to image. And because it's clear, you can probably get a pretty good measurement of the position angle separation. And one thing I want to quickly mention is that even though this image here that we see in Speckle Toolbox is a completely fake image, it's an autocorrelation, not a real image, it still retains the same pixel scale and orientation as the real image. So if we measure the distance, the separation of pixels and the orientation, that matches to real life and that isn't broken. So we can use a real picture and then transfer those that calibration data, the pixel scale and stuff, to the um, the pseudo image, I guess, the fake image. <laughs> and it's and it won't break anything. And that's how we're able to make these measurements easily. I have a question for you guys. Yes. So it, correct me if I'm wrong. I may be wrong about this, but you, those two side images, we don't know which one is the real star, right? This, it could be either one or the, or the other. Yes, it could be either one or the other. Uh, right. So that's all I wanted to. Sh and by the way, don't use that word fake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK. Actually, now I've been interrupted. Uh, could I ask you another question or two? Uh, so, yes. so you showed us uh, two partially resolved stars in the, one of the prior images. Yes. Are you going to show us the two stars resolved using Speckle? This is the, those two stars resolved in Speckle. So one of those is a star and one of those is a sideband? Yes, this image is deceptive. It looks like a picture of the star, like the, the bright spot in the middle that looks like the primary star. That's actually not a star. It is a representation of the star. It technically, the very center pixel is technically, I believe, the image squared, <laughs> if that makes any sense. It's a Fourier transform. It's, so it doesn't have any resemblance, or it doesn't have any correspondence to the real image, except for the pixel scale and orientation remaining the same. It is a representation of the image. And that's why we have these two sidebands. So this is not a picture of the two stars in any way? Yes, this is not. This 
is absolutely not a picture of the two stars. And it, so, it, it is deceptive. It really does look like it might be. It, it, you're right, it does. And uh, so are we going to get to that point or is that not the objective of your speckle analysis? That is not the objective because we don't need to get to that point. There is a way to get to that point where we can do bispectrum, which um, Dave Rowe also has. I can actually show you um, in the tools right below speckle processes of bispectrum processing. And this goes from, this does normal speckle, but then it does some fancy under the hood stuff, which um, I'm not sure how exactly works, but it, it generates a diffraction limited image. So not a diffraction limited representation of an image, a, a, a real image that can have photometry done on it. And Kala and I are working to see how reliable that photometry is. But the speckle image that we get here, photometry cannot be done on, on this. So I have another question. How does this compare to say lucky imaging, uh, really zooming in and then doing an analysis with something like uh, auto stacker uh, and aligning all those 50 frames per second or 100 frames, whatever you're taking with your CMOS camera, uh, the result of which will be an image of two stars as compared to what you're showing us here. So have, if you took the same data and did an analysis by auto stacker, how would that compare to what you're doing? I have done auto stacker. I, I use Registax, but same in principle. And the images that it gives are clear. And I have not done a study or I don't know many studies that have compared speckle to lucky imaging. However, if we look at this picture here, this was taken on a 1.5 meter telescope and lucky imaging depends on getting a good picture. So you have to get lucky <laughs> in the name where if you have a large aperture, there's so many atmospheric cells that are over the aperture that there's always going to be distortion and you're never going to get a lucky picture. I believe the probability of a lucky image drastically decreases as the aperture increases. And so with the six inch telescope, which is what I have, I would imagine that doing speckle and lucky imaging with auto stacker would probably give about the same results. But for a larger telescope, say in the range of maybe half a meter or so, anything above half a meter, you're gonna get diminishing returns where you're gonna need a lot of frames because there's very few lucky frames within that. And you know, imagine if you were to stack this frame and frames similar to it over and over again, you wouldn't be able to resolve the two stars effectively. So speckled essentially works much farther than lucky imaging does. Okay, thanks. Um, as we go forward, because again, we have to do more each time, it's that I guess human pursuit. Um, Rachel and Russ have been scheming to better manipulate us to do more research. And one way, I guess, <laughs> that we're susceptible is doing, um, Rachel and Russ have created the uh, NSTAR Student Robotic Telescope Network, which um, so far its primary goal is to do speckle interferometry remotely. And I was kind of the first test run. Kala and, and that study is, is the first kind of test of it. And FIRO, which is the Fairborn Institute Remote Observatory directed by Russ Janay, he has a more permanent installation, which you can see here, that is going to be doing lots of speckle interferometry, something that's more than just um, two or three nights of observing runs. This is going to be doing observing runs hopefully every night and hopefully somewhat automated so I don't have to stay up every night, although I could do that regardless. It's currently um, conducting its first run of science. We are staying up quite a bit, doing lots of double stars, and we have a preliminary paper going. And Russ has several papers down planned, and so we have quite our work cut out for us, <laughs> which is great. But seriously, though, we actually really enjoy doing this. It really is fun because this double star research, it's amazing to finally break through the seeing limit and be able to measure double stars. Um, and here are some projects that we're currently working on. 
there's the first remote student speckle paper, which um, the, da the data is from the observing run that Ryan, Caroline, uh, Jed and I got. And so that's about the thir those 31 stars. And we talk about remote observing and the um, software used, and we do some uh, data analysis where we compare our measurements to the historical measurements. And we also um, look at how our data compares to the LCO 0.4 meter telescope. And we, um, even though the LCO telescope is a lot bigger, speckle interferometry more than makes up for that. And it results in clearer images that we can use for close level stars. And then there's also the, um, another, pa another paper and the data is from the Mount Wilson 16 inch telescope, as well as some data from other um, observatories in the in-star network. And with the 16 inch telescope, you can get to stars with separations of 0.1 arc seconds, which is a lot closer than the 1.89 that we were so excited about. And when you have stars this close, their orbits are uh, much shorter. So we were able to look at stars where orbits have already been observed and completed, and we were able to compare our measurement to the ephemeris and see where the um, position should be compared to what we got. Yes. And looking forward, there's a lot of opportunities with the new Gaia data release. Uh, well, it's not necessarily new, but um, there's so much data, it might as well just be new because <laughs> we barely scratched the surface of it. Uh, Dave, um, again, showing up, he has written a program, the Gaia uh, database search tool, I believe, GDS, which he compiled all the double stars that can be identified in the Gaia catalog. So with ones with similar parallax and proper motion. And a lot of these stars, which look like they might be orbiting, are not in the Washington double star catalog. And many of these are in the one to five arc second range, which is the perfect range for speckle interferometry. And there exists a need for measuring all these double stars and NSTAR is working to, to um, develop a program to measure these stars kind of at large and do a very large volume study of that. And then I first got into research with astrophotography. So I figured it would be suitable to show some of the pictures I've taken. Um, I remember a long time ago, I took a picture of a star cluster, but my mount didn't go too properly. And so all it was was just a random star field. So I was pretty bummed. And then I saw a double star in the frame. And I, I asked myself a question. I said, can I measure this double star? And can I publish a paper? That single question, <laughs> that single question was the wrong question to ask. Um, that led me down quite the rabbit hole, as well as the rabbit hole in astrophotography. And this was all taken with my six inch classical castigrain. And um, this picture I'm particularly proud of is the Tulip Nebula. Um, it, I actually took it over July 4th, so, so pretty recently. And just thinking back, um, Rachel, Russ, and my teacher, Kalei Talk, um, who's also affiliated with NSTAR, she's the vice president, alongside Rachel. Um, it, they really give me a lot of options and a, a lot of opportunities, and it's been amazing to work with these people. And to, it's so satisfying to have each of your projects, each of your papers, to see a progression to where you look back and you say, okay, this paper I started out and this paper I did more. And, you know, just that satisfaction of knowing that you're doing more each time and progressing in a field that was originally of an intro. Cause Rachel mentioned double stars are like the, the, the easy, the easiest paper to do. And, you know, being able to take something like that and go to a point that is much further is very satisfying and very grateful that Rachel has allowed that. So. Uh, a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, I think the question's been answered, but the objective is to get the exact separation between the stars. Uh, but Rachel answered that it's for astronom astrom uh, astrometry. Astrometry. I'm sorry, I almost didn't get that out, Rachel. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So could you just clarify that? So you know, give us a, a couple of minutes on the objective. And by the way, you guys hand off the presentation better than anyone else I've ever seen. You have a clue. What's the signal? Hmm? What, what's the signal to hand off between your two presentations? We'd want to know. Um, hey, so, I digress. If you can answer the first question, I appreciate it. Yeah, well, we, we just got it down. Cal and I, we just went through it. 
uh, 30 minutes before. <laughs> and, you know, memorize, okay, I'll talk here and you talk there. And <laughs> worked out. Um, Rachel, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, so the, the astrometry, we are just measuring the separation and the position angle uh, between the two stars to add to what what's already known. So many of the stars that we have studied in the past 10 years of these programs, you know, were first discovered and reported by John Herschel and, and others, you know, hundreds of years ago, 100, 200 years ago. But um, we're sort of adding to the databases of of positioning of the of stars, hopefully finding ones that are orbiting and, and use that information, of course, can then lead to uh, masses and everything about stars. But yeah, the, the goal is to measure the position angle and the separation of the two stars. Do you ever just scan your photographs or just go hunting for new double stars that haven't been discovered? Ryan? I can say something about that, yes. Oftentimes, I will, in my astrophotography, I will go through the pictures and, and note stars that are close, and I'll go to um, the Gaia catalog and see if they have similar parallax and proper motions, and oftentimes they do, as, as in they could possibly be gravitationally bound, and there's this one double star that I found, it was like magnitude 17, it was some really faint star in, in the corner of my image in this galaxy cluster, it was, it was in the foreground, and it looked like it was gravitationally bound, but it did not have a WDS number. So yes, there are double stars all over the sky, everywhere that are not measured and not in the WDS. And I encourage all of you to look through your images and check for these double stars. And if you find a double star, maybe write a paper over it and you can, you know, get a discover code on it. But didn't we, didn't we kind of learn that over half the stars are really double stars? Yeah, There's yeah, a, lot a, lot of, a lot of stars are doubles. However, not many are doubles that we can measure because if we're looking at a four arc second double, because astrophotography is going to be seeing limited four arc second, five arc second is about the limit there. Anything over that separation is automatically a very wide star, you know, a thousand astronomical units. So a lot of stars are like spectroscopic binaries where they're so close you can't even resolve it with Hubble. <laughs> it's just you can only see it with the Doppler shift. So although a lot of stars are binaries, not many stars are binaries that we can measure. And, and how do you differentiate between a, a true double star and one that's where it's just parallax? Um, like an optical, like where you see two stars in the sky, but they're not actually orbiting? The, right, they just happen to over mostly overlap and they might look to be a double star to you, right? Yeah, um, there's actually no way to tell without using the amazing catalog provided by Gaia um, because they look like two stars um, or they look like a double star. If you go to the Gaia catalog, you can look at the parallax motion or the parallax values and that tells the distance to the stars. And if the parallaxes are the same, the distances are the same. And then you can also look at proper motions. If the proper motions are the same, they're moving through space at about the same velocity, which means they have the potential to be orbiting. The only way to actually confirm a double star is to take measurements of it. And then maybe a hundred years later, after a hundred more measurements, <laughs> then you might see an arc. And that indicates that there's some gravitational um, relationship. But otherwise, there, there is no way to tell if a star is a double or uh, sorry, uh, if a star is a true binary. I have a couple of questions. One is um, everything that you were using, including the software, um, is available to amateurs. This is there's nothing there's nothing fancy there. Yes. Okay. Um, the um, software you were using, the Speckle software from Plane Wave, that's uh, is that a free download also? That is free. However, it's not down. You can't download it off the internet. You're going to have to email Dave Rowe for a copy of the software and he will provide it. Okay. Um, have you ever played with a, uh, with a uh, three star system? What happens then? I, there actually that picture that I showed in the slide was a three star system, I believe at the beginning. It gives very strange results with autocorrelation. Um, you get like duplicate, because those sidebands get duplicated for the 
tertiary, like I think, um, twice. So you have like six stars. I'm, I'm not actually totally sure. Kelly you might know more than I with this because you messed with that data a lot more than I did. Um, but yeah, triple stars get kind of confusing. And for that, that bispectrum processing, which I briefly mentioned is better suited because that gets you the actual image. And so it's a lot easier to not get confused, which is which. Hmm. Thank you. I, I have one more question. This is interesting. So my mind is, is working, which is pretty rare this time of night. But, uh, do you ever go to some of the space telescope data and look at that information? They obviously don't have atmosphere issues and they can probably resolve double stars. I don't want to say easily, but certainly better than ground-based. Yes, the Hipparchos um, satellite, that did a lot of resolving, and I, I'm not sure who did it, um, but there was this publication of some sorts that published all the Hipparchos data into double stars. And so if you look at historical measurements for double stars, oftentimes they, they will have an H for Hipparchos, and that's that telescope making that measurement. And there's only one measurement because it only measured the star once. Gaia does not have that. Although I'm, I, I believe Rachel, you might have some knowledge about this. That there might be an initiative to get some Gaia data into the WDS. Do you know if that's going to happen? Yeah, I, actually, I think that's sort of a slow process where it has to be published first to get into the WDS. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that's working. Um, well, um, yeah, that there might be sometime in the future we might pull up a plot of the historical measurements and there'll be a G for Gaia or something. Yeah, I don't know. But yes, you can go and look at data straight from the in, the, in the catalogs, and you can find double stars using that, which is what Dave Rowe did with his Gaia search tool. He he didn't start with the WDS, he started with the Gaia data, and then said, okay, this star from Gaia is this WDS um, star, but then this star from Gaia doesn't have a WDS number. So it, it has been done before, yes. And also, uh, Eric, to your question earlier, if, if students or if anyone goes through just through their images and looks for stars, I'll say um, there's a paper that's probably going to come out in the Journal of Double Star Observations in um, the next issue or two, where students actually selected a double star to study. They took images but couldn't resolve the two in the images they got, but noticed two other sets that looked like they might be double stars, and they ended up doing their research on those two pairs of double stars and figured out that one of them could potentially be a binary system based on Gaia data. So other students definitely have been doing that as well, which is really exciting. Alex, I think I'm all set here. Okay. Um, do you have more things that you would like to tell us about tonight? And anybody out there that's uh, got on YouTube, be sure to get your questions in because we're gonna start wrapping up here. Um, Rachel and yeah. Ryan and Kala, do you have something else you'd like to tell us? Um, I just wanted to kind of mention to, to wrap it up and, and bring it to a close that this is um, kind of amazing work that started from just as simple as Ryan kind of talked about, a simple double star project to now something that's all encompassing of their lives, but is really being transformative <laughs> and they're helping to build a robotic, a student robotic telescope network for research that will be 100% dedicated to, you know, this this process and what the students are learning. It's not just about making these measure, measurements. It's about learning how to write and communicate scientifically. And I think we saw that they know how to communicate scientific information pretty darn well. Um, but the fact that you know they're having, they're going to have several published papers. Ryan already has a couple. Um, I don't know about everyone out there listening and watching, but if you think that the first time you published a paper, if you have published one, I know I wasn't in, in high school when I first published and it's just an amazing process. And you guys rock, thank you. And thanks for inviting us to talk, you guys. Well, thanks for coming. And I'd have to say that if one of the goals of this program is to uh, enable students and others to learn how to communicate well you got a couple of winners there that's for sure those they're very smooth presentation um you guys did a great job and it's got a, good, a couple of good comments i'm going to share my screen a little bit now if i can figure out how to do it again share my entire screen doink 
share and head over here. Um, as you know, there's a big comment section over here where you can ask any questions. And if you've got any questions, get them in quick because they're, we're about to go away here. Um, so, um, but also there's a couple of other buttons. There's one here that you can use to donate to the Astro Imaging channel, help us pay for the website and things like that. And one of the more important things is that you think about um, um, uh, signing up and becoming a member. Uh, we have 9.15 subscribers. We're picking up about 50 a week, and that's good. It's our goal to get to 10,000. So over here, you can see that. And so you click on that, and you can become a member, or you can be, uh, you can subscribe, and we can send you notices of when the meetings are going to be and stuff like that. That's particularly important when something like this happens, and um, our announced presenter isn't able to be here and we need to pick up somebody else so i want to thank you all for coming tonight um it is a new moon weekend and i hope you're all exhausted from staying up the last couple of nights and having fun looking and uh as far as on california it's still light outside but um in about an hour and a half i'll be out there looking for looking for a comet and uh, hope that you, if you've got some comment pictures, get a hold of us on the Astro Imaging channel and uh, ask us how you can send in your example of a comment so we can, we can we'll make a start, you know, we'll give it a two or three weeks and then we'll make some kind of slideshow out of it. I think we got everything. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Be sure to like it. Be sure to um, subscribe. And we're going to check out. I've got to turn it back over to the man in charge. Tolga, take it away. Take us out.